you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me now to Hebrews chapter number four, excuse me, chapter one and verse four. Hebrews chapter number one. Stand with me, if you will, and let's begin reading in verse number four. Hebrews chapter one and verse four. Today I want to talk to you a few minutes about this uh, Christ-centered worship as our value around the subject that Jesus is better than the angels. He's more superior uh, to the angels, beginning now in verse four, being made so much better than the angels, uh, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. And they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he in any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the power, the strength, and the validity of your word. I pray, God, that it will cut and pierce and divide and heal all at the same time. I pray that your word would open the eyes of the blind that they might see their need for Jesus and be gloriously saved. May your word today give us a little bit of a glimpse of who you are. I suspect, Lord, that none of us in this room really have grabbed hold of the essence of who you are. I suspect none of us have really figured out exactly how great you are and how wonderful you are. And Lord, today I pray that your word would draw us just a little bit closer to the reality of that. May Jesus be exalted. May he be lifted up so that he could draw all men unto himself. I ask it now in the power of the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Be seated, would you please? Now, the writer of Hebrews is not disguising the fact at all that Jesus is greater, more superior, and better than uh, the angels. Now, the Jews had a great preoccupation with angels. Um, I, I don't know, I tried to find out over the last week uh, exactly how many searches were done on Google to uh, find out how many times the word angel was uh, looked up, but uh, couldn't do it. We have a major preoccupation with angels in uh, our culture as well. Uh, many books are written about angels. We have them on the mantles in our houses and on the mirrors of our car. They're hung up, but this writer to the Jews in their preoccupation and their belief. Uh, they had major categories that they had listed what the angels were involved in. There was destroying angels, there's death angels, there's persecuting angels, there's personal angels, there are protecting angels. I'll give you uh, eight facts that the Bible records for our learning about angels. First of all, they are not flesh and blood, but they are spiritual in nature. 
Second, they appear in various forms. On one occasion, the Bible says that there was an angel of lightning. And then third, they are highly intelligent beings with emotions. You find them in heaven every time that somebody would get saved down here on earth that uh, they go to rejoicing up in glory about the salvation of that person. They don't marry and they are incapable of procreation. Fifth, they are not subject to death as we are. If you get over into Revelation chapter 12, when one third of the angels fell out of heaven, uh, they did not die. Uh, then six, they were created uh, before men. David Daniel says that there are myriads of angels and that they have an assigned task. Seventh, they are highly organized. You find in scripture where they are divided into ranks. And then eighth, they have a purpose. And their purpose is to minister to God and to us. You say, well, Mike, uh, if there's so much in the Bible about angels, why don't we study about angels? Well, the fact of the matter is, uh, these same angels that we have just described to you also bow down to Jesus. And uh, what little time that you and I have here on this earth, uh, I'm convinced we need to be spending bowing down to the Lord Jesus and serving him and uh, in great anticipation that he is going to come back. Now, I want to look for a few minutes this morning in ways in which Jesus is superior to these angels. Notice in that very first verse, he uses the term better. Now that little Greek word appears 19 times in the New Testament. You might find it interesting that 17 out of those 19 times, it is recorded in the book of Hebrews. Now as we study verses 4 through 14, you're going to find that a lot of that passage is quotes from the Old Testament, primarily quotes from the book of Psalms. The first thing I want you to see with me this morning is that Jesus is superior in name. Notice verse four, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Not only does the Bible say that Jesus is superior to angels, he says that he is superior to them in name. Now verse five is a Psalms quote uh, and notice what it says in verse five, but uh, unto which of the angels said he at any time, you're my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When did the Bible ever say that? Well, nowhere in the Old Testament, nowhere at any place or at any time did God ever refer to his angels as his son. Now, we only have uh, recorded in the word of God three names that are given to angels. As best as we know, the rest of the angels are not named. We have Gabriel, we have Michael, and we have Lucifer. Gabriel in scripture is glorious in ministry. Michael in scripture is glorious in might. Lucifer in scripture is glorious in majesty. But when you get to thinking about that, now Gabriel being glorious in ministry, understand that Jesus is the Messiah in whom messengers are sent to tell about. Michael is glorious uh, in majesty, uh, but understand that Jesus is almighty. Uh, and Lucifer uh, is uh, the fallen star, but aren't you glad that Jesus is the bright and the morning star that is sent by God to light the way for all of us. Now, verse five is a verse that the JWs really like to come by your house and they like to talk about it. Notice what it says in verse five. For unto which of the angels said in any time, for you're my son, uh, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I'll be to him a father, he shall be to me a son. Now, they like to declare, these JWs like to take that verse 
and declare that Jesus was a created being. May I say to you, when they come by your house on Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon and start talking to you about Jesus being a created being, just simply say, not so. You understand that Christ's sonship did not become a reality until the incarnation. Before the incarnation, he is God and all of the names of the Old Testament that are attributed to God are attributed to him. He never lost his identity with Father God and he is still God. The Bible says that he is superior to the angels in name. Aren't you glad when we bear the name of Jesus that it calms our fears? Aren't you glad that at the name of Jesus, demons have to stand and salute? Aren't you glad that at the name of Jesus, sickness and illness and disease can be driven out? Aren't you glad that at the name of Jesus, the fallen are lifted and those that are in despair are encouraged at the name that is above all names? Second, I'd like for you to see that Jesus is superior to worth of the angels. Now, we don't know uh, what an angel is worth. No one knows the answer to that. But look with me, if you will, at verse 6. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. You see, God commands that Jesus be worshipped. Well, what is he saying here? He's putting Jesus on the same level as God and rightfully so because he is God. Amen goes right there. Now listen, if I'm going to have to preach and say amen all at the same time, it's just going to keep us longer than we're going to have to stay. Okay. So the cults come along and uh, they make a lot out of this term firstborn. May I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that has absolutely nothing to do with birth order or time, but it has everything in the world to do with position. Understand this, Solomon, God made firstborn, even though Solomon was 10th in the pecking order in his family. Uh, Ishmael was born 13 years prior to Isaac. But God made Isaac the firstborn because it would be through his lineage that the Son of God would be born. So the cults come along and they say that Jesus uh, is created. And since he is created, he is less than God. Not so, ladies and gentlemen. He's called that because he was before creation and all creation is his heritage. Now, all of the angels were created, but the Bible says that the Son was begotten. Now, if you go to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only... Y'all are getting the idea now. You're getting the idea. Gave his only begotten. Do you know what that word begotten means? It means uniquely conceived uniquely conceived. The Holy Spirit of God planted himself in the womb of Mary so that Jesus would never lose his divinity. He was uniquely divine, conceived, God himself. And the Bible comes along in verse number six and he says, let all of the angels worship him. That confirms the argument that Jesus is superior to the angels. Turn over in your Bible, if you will, for just a minute to Revelation and chapter number four. And I want you to read with me, uh, beginning in verse number nine, if you will. Revelation, just a few more pages over. Uh, And chapter number four, and uh, let's start with verse nine. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power 
Now watch this. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You understand that Jesus is to be eternally worshipped. He is to be eternally worshipped in heaven, and he's to be worshipped here on this earth. Now the message, that message, is to complement the main event. Uh, the worship of God is the main event. Now, let me put that in some today's terms, if I will, because, you know, a lot of people just don't care about music. They may not particularly care about a particular style of music. And they'll make statements like this. You know, um, I'm just going to get there in time for the main event. I'm going to skip the preliminaries. And I'm just going to get there in time for the main event. As if the message itself was the main event. May I say to you, the message is not the main event. When we get into glory, I'm going to be without a job up there. I don't get to preach anymore. Any, please don't say amen at that point. I, <laughs> I, I know. But I'm going to be without a job. And look what's going to be happening. They're still going to be praising and singing and glorifying the Lord. That's the main event. And by the way, if you don't enjoy, quote unquote, the preliminaries down here, you're gonna be pretty miserable when you get into heaven. Mm -hmm. So, he's superior in name. He's superior in worth. Now watch what happens. He's superior to angels in function. In function. Now notice verse 7, because verse 7 is a quote from Psalms 104, verse 4. Verse 7 says, And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? He's saying here that the angels are God's wind and God's fire. Now, you understand that wind blows and fire burns. You see, the wind and the fire are to be man's servants. And so when we can harness the wind, when we can harness the fire, then we can master them rather than be mastered by them. They, they then become our servants and not our masters. And the function here of the angels is to deliver God's message. Now, this didn't go over very good at uh, 8 o'clock. Uh, Y'all are much more astute and bright uh, and filled with intelligia uh, more than the 8 o'clock crowd is, so I'm sure you're going to get it. So these angels are not the postmaster. They are the postman. Well, y'all didn't get that very good either. <laughs> hmm. Y you see, they are the messengers, not the message. And so here you understand the Lord Jesus has an entirely different role than do the angels. Look at verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now it bothers me when the cults come around, or anybody for that matter, that uh, wants to belittle the Lord Jesus, and to pull him down to a level that makes him less than God. I get really bothered by that. When I went into college and into seminary, I had many in the educational realm that did exactly the same time. Here I go in there, and their number one ambition is to graduate a bunch of preachers that go out into the world preaching with question marks. When I showed up down there to become a preacher that preaches with an exclamation point, mm, I get bothered. When somebody wants to make Jesus less than who he is. You understand something? God calls Jesus God. And if God called Jesus God, he's God. Amen? He's God. That's what the Hebrew writer is doing here. Now I want you to see three words with me in verse number eight that I think are very significant. Notice if you will, but unto the son he saith, Thy throne. Underline that word throne there. 
Uh, that, that's, that's a word that, that just kind of jumps out. It, it, Jesus sits on the throne and sitting on the throne, obviously then, he is a ruler. Now go on with me and let's get the second word. He says, oh, God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, now what's a scepter that, that is there? It, he's talking about one who judges, one who makes decision, one who rins out the word of God. So you've got Jesus on the throne as the ruler and he is making decisions and he is ruling and he is rending out the word of God. Now there's a third word, thy scepter. Notice what he says, the latter part of verse eight is the scepter of thy kingdom. He's talking here about the vastness of the kingdom of God. You understand angels are serving while Jesus is reigning. Angels minister before the throne and Jesus is sitting on the throne. Now notice verse nine. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Now th those are strong words uh, that just paints Jesus as a black and white uh, individual here. Uh, if we are to be in any way like Jesus, well, we can't say I love righteousness while at the same time entertaining wickedness in our hearts. Now, I get a little bit passionate about that because it still really bothers me when I see people waffling in their walk with God. When I see them hot one day and cold the next and in one day and out the next. When I see them breathing out words of exaltation in one breath and while in the next breath they're saying some form of wicked language. It bothers me. And, and, and they'll come, well, Pastor, we, we just can't be sticks in the mud in this culture. We can't go around being Bible thumpers with everybody. You, you got to get along to go. We got to go along to get along. And, and you got to be elastic uh, in this culture that we're living in. And I've got a good word for that. It's baloney. You understand, folks, we, 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 we give as much as the scriptures give. We are as elastic as the Bible is elastic. You can't go around saying, I love purity and I love righteousness and I love holiness and I love godliness while at the same time practicing some kind of ungodly practice in your life. You can't do it. Amen. We gotta love what Jesus loves. We gotta hate what Jesus hates. Now notice what he says now in the latter part of verse nine. And therefore God, even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about the angels. Now I don't know how many angels there are, but there, there may possibly be 25 trillion angels. May, may I say to you that you could lump all of the angels up under one big lump with all of their virtue and all of their goodness and all of their greatness and all of their glory and put it all together in one and they couldn't come up to one zillionth of the worth of the Lord Jesus himself. Now notice this little, little term, oil of gladness. You, you, you understand, Jesus did his ministry with joy. With joy, say that word joy. Joy. I see a lot of people in ministry. But somebody needs to tell their face that it's supposed to be accompanied with joy. We need to go about it with joy. How we need to mimic how Jesus did his ministry. Now, let me give you the fourth. Christ is superior to the angels in duration. Watch this in verse 10. It is a quote from Psalm 102. And thou, Lord, in the beginning, hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. Notice the term Lord. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about Jesus. Now you understand, angels did not create the world. The Lord, Jesus Christ, is our 
creator God. He is the sustainer of that creation. Verse 11. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, and thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Not only is he the creator and sustainer, he is the one who endures through it all. Now, so you're watching here, you're seeing a major contrast between creator and creation. One of them is going to wear out, and the other, the Bible says, is going to last forever. Now, I know that it appears sometimes that I am extremely hard on radical environmentalism. And there's a reason for that appearance. I am. <laughs> you see, we've got a whole generation in America today that has bought in to Satan's lies that somehow that creation is as sacred as the creator, even to the point of worshiping the creation. Romans 1 says that that happens. In spite, now I've got news for you, in spite of all of your tax, tax dollars, billions and billions of your tax dollars and my tax dollars, in spite of all of that going out, to try and stop creation from giving out, the Bible says that this earth is involved in a process called entropy, E-N-T-R-O-P-Y. It is the deterioration of energy and matter. And it's going on as we speak. The Bible plainly tells us that the earth is wearing out just like you and me. We're not what we used to be 10 years ago. Y'all ever been to a high school class reunion like I had to go to this year? <laughs> my wife, she took her elbow when we'd meet one of my old girlfriends and she'd hit me in the side and she'd go, <laughs> I thank God every minute of that. It, it was amazing to me. You know, we, did, we just not... The, the same, there comes a time we don't see as well. There comes a time that we don't hear as well. There comes a time that you won't walk as straight as you once did. That's all normal. The Bible says that this old tent of ours is deteriorating. But aren't you glad one of these days that we're going to trade in this old tent that's wearing out and frazzled and rotten on the vine. We're going to trade it in for a brand new tent that's never going to wear out. Now, we ought to be good stewards. Now, you hear my heart now. Don't, don't shut me completely out. I am convinced that we ought to be good stewards of everything that God has entrusted to us, including uh, his creation, but we ought not to give our lives to it. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and everything in it will be burned up. That's what the word of God says. It's all going to come to a finish. Now that doesn't mean that we rape the earth, but the creation is not to outlast the creator. The Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will last forever and ever. Let me give you one more. He is superior. Jesus is superior in position. Watch this in verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? He's talking here about a position of exaltation and not one time has any angel ever been invited to occupy that position never before look at verse 14 are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation now we're not told how many angels are sent to serve us I'm not really sure 
uh, about any of that. Matter of fact, I don't give a flip about any of that to begin with. Why is that? Because that's God's business and not mine. All I know is one day God came along to an old angel. He said to the angel, I want you to go down there and get old Philip. I know he's in the midst of that big revival down there and a lot of people getting saved and, 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 and we've really been using him, but I want you to go get Philip and I want you to take him out to the desert. There's an Ethiopian eunuch out there in a chariot and he's on his way home and he's hungry to be saved. And so you go get Philip and you take him down there to that eunuch so that that eunuch could be saved. You see, the ministry today is a mystery, but I can tell you this, a sovereign God is still working. The King of Kings is still on the throne. The Lord Jesus has a divine plan in mind for our life. I've said all of that to say this, Christ is superior. He's King of Kings and he's Lord of Lords.